Uh, this is the risks of single maintainer dependencies. Um, bear with me, still dealing with the jet lag, but in this talk, we are gonna chat about the lottery factor, contributor communities, and the secure software supply chain. So one of the things I always ask myself whenever I show up to one of these talks is, okay, well, who the heck are you? And yes, I promise it is relevant for this talk. Uh, so my name is John McBride. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at VMware, and I work on our open source Kubernetes platform, which is Tanzu Community Edition, uh, along with a bunch of ancillary open source projects around that, Kubernetes, Kind, uh, and one of those projects is SPF 13 Cobra. Now, if you don't know what Cobra is, is it's a CLI bootstrapping library uh, for Go that gives you a bunch of really nice APIs for creating commands and a really modern CLI application. Uh, tons of stuff uses it uh, all over the CNCF, all over Kubernetes. Uh, so just some quick statistics here on Cobra itself. It has over 26,000 stars on GitHub. It has over 900 commits. And again, it is a key dependency in the CNCF Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, just to touch on a few projects that use it, Kubernetes itself, KubeCuddle, Helm, Tanzu at VMware, Docker, etcd, Istio, Linkerd, the GitHub CLI. I mean, it's everywhere. If it was written in Go, it probably uses Cobra. Let's uh, touch on a brief history of Cobra here. Cobra's first commit was in 2013. And it came out of sort of that same group at Google that was doing, uh, that was doing core Go. Uh, so it sat right at home within Kubernetes and with KubeCuddle and a lot of the stuff that came out of Kubernetes in the early days of Go. Uh, for example, here is the default KubeCuddle command that returns us a Cobra command. It really is the entry point for your actual implementation of your actual features and all the stuff you're actually trying to do. Cobra wraps around all of that stuff. Uh, let's fast forward to today and this is the 1.4.0 release that I cut in March. And something interesting to, I guess, realize about where we're at today with Cobra is that I more or less maintain Cobra by myself. Um, now, before I go any further, let's define what maintaining means here. I have admin privileges on the repository. I can merge code, so merge pull requests. Uh, I can triage issues, close issues, and I can cut releases. They're sending those packages, sending those APIs into Kubernetes, into VMware, into Red Hat, into Google, all over. And again, before I continue here, a uh, huge shout out to the Cobra community. Um, it's actually gotten much better recently. Some other maintainers have stepped up. There's people doing code contributions and still a part of the community. Uh, but one of the questions that uh, I get asked pretty frequently you know, about the last few years is, okay, how did, how did I get here? What happened? Well, I was at Pivotal, which was acquired by VMware, and there were a number of people who were also doing Cobra Dev uh, that left, attritions, you know, that sort of normal thing, and then the pandemic, and, you know, I often ask myself this question, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> but uh, I found myself as the solo maintainer for Cobra. I am a solo maintainer for Cobra. Uh, let's define what solo maintainer is. A solo maintainer is an individual or a small group of individuals maintaining a project with little to no support. These are people on their nights and weekends. They're not getting paid. Uh, just a passion project. Um, it's not really part of their job. Those are those solo single maintainers of these projects. Uh, a quick show of hands. Uh, who would define themselves as a single or solo maintainer? if you have a project like that. Okay, uh, that's like 20% of the room, okay. Uh, there's a flip side to that. There are people who consume those projects. Now raise your hand if you would consider yourself a consumer of one of these. Should literally be everybody. Because <laughs> everybody at Kubernetes Cloud Native Con consumes uh, Kubernetes or one of these projects in some way, which consumes Cobra, and here we are. So I think a lot about my experience uh, maintaining Cobra. There it is. Uh, and you know, this talk is really philosophical. It's not a deep dive on the Cobra technology or really how the technology integrates into the Kubernetes and CNCF ecosystem. It's really a deep dive on the solo maintainer experience 
and a lot of the pitfalls that you solo maintainers may find yourself in, uh, and some of the things that you can do to mitigate risks that are associated with these kind of pro uh, projects and challenges. Uh, the flip side of that are the consumers of these projects and what you can do to uh, sort of analyze these risks and approach these risks and hopefully uh, make things a little better. So first I want to talk about contributor communities. And I'm not the first person to talk about how important contributor communities are. I definitely won't be the last person. But contributor communities, as I define them, are a group dedicated to the success of an idea. And I think you can almost look at all of us and this contributor community. People in Kubernetes and the CNCF are really dedicated to the group of ideas around a distributed containerized workflow world. Um, that is a contributor community. More generally in the open source, this might be people uh, contributing back code, contributing to the discussion in some way, contributing issues, feature requests, bugs, or security reports. So why are contributor communities so important? Well, they really are the lifeblood of success and longevity and stability in your projects. From a solo maintainer perspective, uh, I think you know, anybody who's doing this kind of passion project would wanna see their thing get used and be successful. Communities give you that kind of support to give your project legs. One person, two people, three people really could never scale to make something like Kubernetes or any of the CNCF projects as successful as they are today. From a consumer perspective, through providing that support and through being a part of the contributor community, you sort of give a way to give those projects longevity, stability, and support. So I wanna tell a story, and I think this story illustrates really, really well uh, just how powerful contributor communities can be. This is Java and the first browser wars. So let's date ourselves way back to 1995. Uh, there was a quite contentious war for the browser and the early web. At the time, the internet wasn't programmable, it was just static content being served. Uh, and Microsoft Internet Explorer was sort of in this fight with Netscape Navigator. And Netscape Navigator wanted to bring programmability into the web. The way they envisioned this was through bringing the Java VM into the browser to enable Java applets to run right on your web page. And one of my favorites back in the day was RuneScape. I played this so much when I was a kid, but yes, this ran on the Java VM in your browser. So the idea was that Netscape was gonna, was gonna uh, partner with Sun Microsystems to bring Java in. Enter Brandon Ike. Uh, this is a screenshot from the Lex Friedman podcast, number 160, really, really good episode. It's like three hours long, so buckle up, but highly recommend this. Uh, but Brandon Ike was a early employee to Netscape and was tasked with uh, sort of having this happen by bringing Java into the Netscape Navigator browser. He said they, Netscape, started a deal with Sun Microsystems. The idea was to put the Java VM right in the browser. The opportunity was for a companion language. So sort of what he was tasked with was creating this sort of glue duct tape language that maybe designers or product people could use that wasn't too low level uh, at the actual Java VM level. Uh, at the time it was called Mocha, and today it has become JavaScript. Uh, Brandon and I created this thing in 10 days. He said the, uh, the internet meant there was a huge first mover advantage, being fast, getting out first. It mattered a lot. So they got something out really fast in 10 days, and it had a ton of sharp edges. It was almost unusable. Uh, he also said, worse is better. I don't know what that says about JavaScript, but there you go. But JavaScript really took off, and people loved it. Uh, frameworks and snippets and different libraries, and it grew fast beyond Brandon Ike and the people at Netscape. Today, JavaScript is the most popular programming language in the world. Uh, this is the Stack Overflow 2021 developer survey. Uh, Java on the web is basically no more. You know, and there's a lot we could dive into this story, but the contributor communities were so important in making this happen. Without a community, you risk success. Without a community, you risk longevity. So the lesson learned here, communities are a necessary, unstoppable force. For solo maintainers, 
Uh, you need to invest in your communities. And I would argue you need to invest in your communities almost as much as you invest in code. Uh, that way you can build a system of support around you to give you that longevity, to give you that support that you need in your project. Uh, for consumers of these single maintainer dependencies, uh, be a part of the community. That's it, be a part of the community. Uh, giving that support to the maintainers, being there for them when they need reviews or uh, any number of things within the community. You become a part of that system of support. All right, next, let's talk about the secure software supply chain. Uh, and the secure software supply chain always makes me chuckle a little bit because I never really know what it is. <laughs> but the way I define it in this talk is it's a dedicated automatic process for consistent replication of deliverables. And I think this is actually best illustrated by some animations I made here. Uh, oh, whoops, nope. Uh, before I talk about that, we also need to talk about the maintainers of these projects. I think oftentimes, Oftentimes, we forget about the people, the people as part of the secure software supply chain. There's a lot of really interesting things happening with, with SIG store and uh, S-bombs within Kubernetes and CNCF, but we forget about the people sometimes. Okay, why? Uh, why are the people so important? Well, really, in my opinion, maintainers are the secure software supply chain. Uh, without maintainers, it, it all falls apart. You don't have people maintaining your S-bombs. You don't have people maintaining your CICD systems. Okay, here's the animations. Uh, so let's illustrate this with some of these animations I made. Here, these are some packages, maybe a product, maybe a library like Cobra. Um, and let's look inside of these packages that we're shipping to our consumers, to our, our, uh, our, our customers. Everything's good. Everything is as expected, and we can ship that away and all is good. Now, let's say we come to the next release. Some more packages, these are gonna go out to people, consumers, whoever. We look inside and there's some bad middleware or something. That gets shipped out to people. Maybe it's a CVE or a hack that happened and people are not happy. Maybe we have to make a statement or do a nasty patch release or something. It's, ugh, it gets messy. What if we had some dedicated automatic system that could detect these things and stop them from happening. We detected some bad middleware, something got injected, we can stop it there, all is good. Now again, I think oftentimes we forget about the actual people. These people have to maintain these CICD systems, the SBOMs, SIG store itself. And you know, in this case, it's being maintained, all is well. But unfortunately, people fall asleep, people leave projects, um, sometimes people just completely abandon projects left to dust. In this case, this person is, is gone, They're, they've fallen asleep, we have another release, but our whole secure software supply chain system has gone into disarray. We have another bad middleware, we can't catch it. Things are not right, it gets shipped off to people. Uh, and I want to illustrate this with another story here. And I think this really illustra illustrates well how important the single maintainer, the solo maintainers are uh, within the broader secure software supply chain. So this is NPM Event Stream and the Crypto Bandit. A number of years ago, uh, on this project Event Stream, which was a popular JavaScript NPM streaming library, uh, had this issue opened up. And a quick note on this library in NPM, uh, it was used everywhere, but not necessarily on purpose. It was, one of those, it was one of those transitive dependencies that got kind of pulled into everything. Uh, the issue says, I don't know what to say. And the user opened this up and is basically asking the owner, why was this new person given ownership access to the repository and why were they also given NPM publishing uh, access? So essentially this person was publishing new packages to NPM as part of their new ownership of the repository. That person had also made a very, very, very strange commit. Uh, it was decoding and encoding a bunch of random stuff and then getting injected into the actual module. So clearly something very weird was happening. The owner came back and said, uh, he emailed me and said he wanted to maintain this module. So I gave it to him. I don't get anything for maintaining this module and I don't even use it anymore and haven't for years. Then next he said, note, I no longer have publishing rights to this module on NPM. Yes, hackers of the world, it's that easy. You just ask, and then you have it. 
what this thing ended up being was a crypto wallet stealer. So if it was running alongside a uh, crypto wallet, it would attempt to steal all that crypto within there. And it got shipped out as part of an NPM package that then was consumed by a bunch of other NPM packages. And some people thought that maybe this affected hundreds of thousands of people, developers, companies. It was all over. I, I think about this story, <clears throat> excuse me, I think about this story a lot, like all the time. Uh, trust is so hard within this ecosystem, especially as a solo maintainer. Uh, code is hard to trust. Uh, the packages you consume are hard to trust, but oftentimes I find it's the people. Um, it's, it's really hard at the people level as well. So the lesson learned here, invest engineering resources. Uh, first, solo maintainers, please ensure your own security. If you don't have a physical security key yet to do two-factor authentication to GitHub or whatever, please, please go get a physical security key. You have to first ensure your own security so you're not uh, being pried to some of these hacks or attacks. Uh, also, don't be the lone hero riding off into the sunset. You need to bring other people into the inner circle. You need to bring other people into the maintainer track so that you can start handing off responsibilities, that there are other people there to help along the way so that it's not the one person giving up the package, abandoning the, the package like we saw in the NPM story. For consumers, the same goes for that. You need to get on the maintainer track, invest some of your engineering resources, those people, into these important projects. Uh, look at your stack and look where there might be these projects that are at this kind of risk, because this happens and it unfortunately happens all the time. All right, next. Let's chat about the lottery factor. Uh, the way I define the lottery factor in this talk is it is a spectrum of risk correlated with the personnel on a team. Uh, more anecdotally, what it is, is you know, what would happen if I or some really important person on your team, your product team, your open source team, what if they won the $100 million big buck bonus or something and they never touched a keyboard again in their life? They were, just, they were just gone. They did not care. They didn't want to work anymore. That's the lottery factor. And it really is a spectrum. I don't think anything falls too far on one way or another. Uh, sometimes you end up with solos here or there. But in the solo maintainer perspective, that really is the highest level of the lottery factor. Like we saw in that last story, if people leave, that is catastrophic. So why is this important? Well, attrition is normal. It, it happens everywhere. Uh, attrition of critical people is scary. Attrition of solo maintainers can be absolutely catastrophic. These are the people maintaining projects all by themselves that have these you know, massive projects underneath them. Uh, NPM, uh, the NPM event stream, Cobra. So let's tell another story. And this one is a little bit more hypothetical. Uh, it's about Cobra and how cloud native could fall apart. And really from my perspective, Cobra is just, it's, it's a library. It's a bunch of APIs that we ship out uh, important APIs that wrap around a bunch of really important stuff. But what if I just won the lottery one day and then my account got compromised or something else got injected somehow? Those things then would end up getting shipped out into Kubernetes, Istio, Linkerd, Tanzu, Helm, all of these. Uh, and this actually came up recently. Uh, the most recent 1.4.0 release of Cobra had some people from Kubernetes, and I was actually talking to people from SIG CLI yesterday about this. This was huge. We noticed that there were all of these dependencies getting dragged along into Kubernetes and kubectl that really were completely unnecessary. So we were able to remove a ton of dependencies to sort of uh, reduce the surface area of potential attacks, of potential CVEs coming in from those other libraries. This was really, really big. But a question I think everyone needs to ask themselves, especially you solo maintainers, is what if I won the lottery? Really ask yourself that question. Would you work another day in your life? Is your project ready for something like that? And it, it, it's hard. It's really, really hard. I don't think there is a hard solution to this at all. Uh, even on product teams, they deal with this. There's silos everywhere. Uh, you really have to look at it from a spectrum perspective. But I do think that there are some valid strategies. The lesson learned here is create processes to mitigate the lottery factor. Uh, for solo maintainers, 
uh, you need to create that pathway to maintainership, that pathway to the inner circle. And I'm really talking about process here. Like, yes, you can bring people in, but there should be a process that people can start on your project to become a maintainer. Two is documentation. Documentation uh, is really huge, you know? Again, I'm not the first person to talk about how important documentation is. I won't be the last. But documentation, even of the minutia, even of the little things that you think don't matter or aren't a big deal, can become absolutely huge as soon as you're gone, maybe you've abandoned the project, who knows. Consumers, the same goes. Consumers of these projects, you need to get on those tracks to becoming a maintainer, to getting some kind of access right, and contribute back to docs as well. Uh, you can look at the docs, you can read the docs and see where there are problems and start contributing those back. All right, last thing I wanna talk about is incentive models. And this really, this really could have been its own talk in itself. Uh, incentive models are systems to encourage desired behavior. Uh, and you can look at this from your own perspective in the way that you do work. You know, if one day at your job, you just weren't getting paid anymore, I seriously doubt you'd continue working. <laughs> These are incentive models, but they get really, really tricky in open source. For me, personally, it's about uh, personal satisfaction. It's about seeing something get used at this high level and seeing something that I create or PRs or issues that I'm a part of get kind of brought into the bigger good. I think about this sometimes from the perspective of game theory. Game theory is sort of the study and the idea of how n different number of factors, could be a lot, affect a very complex system. And open source, if not the Kubernetes CNCF ecosystem, is incredibly complex. So those incentive models are really complex. You not only have individuals, but also groups of individuals small companies, huge companies. These incentives really are anything and all over the place. Why is this important? Well, really, in my opinion, without incentives, no one would do anything. So you really have to look at the incentives of the important projects that you are consuming and also that you are creating. Let's tell another story. Uh, this is about Faker.js and the dark side of open source. I realized uh, yesterday that I was taking a pretty big dunk on JavaScript, love JavaScript, but these are very relevant stories. Uh, so Faker.js was, or is a testing library f uh, within the NPM ecosystem that you can use to generate all of this testing data. It's really useful for front end when you have forms or a lot of different data with names, dates, all kinds of stuff. It's really, really useful. But one day, back in January of this year, the owner of this project just, just blasted it away. They removed the git commit history. It was just one commit with basically an empty repository. Uh, the NPM packages disappeared as well. You know, and we could go into what the heck was going on here, but you know, a lot of speculation popped up. And one interesting thing from years back that this person had said was no more free work from Merrick. Pay me or fork this. Uh, people did fork it, and it continues on to this day. Uh, without the involvement of this person. But I think you know, a, a, a deep analysis of these important projects and a deep analysis of the incentives of the important people in these important projects should have led some people to this kind of conclusion that, hey, this is risk. This is pure risk right here. So the lesson learned is without these incentive models, without looking at these incentive models, everything else risks falling apart. Uh, you risk your collaborator community falling apart, you risk your secure software supply chain falling apart, everything. Uh, those critical people and their incentives should align. So solo maintainers, uh, you need to identify your own incentives. Maybe it is getting paid. Uh, start a Patreon, there are GitHub sponsors. You need to start working towards those things. Uh, it's critical that you identify your own incentives and that you start working towards those. For consumers of these projects, I think this is especially key here. This is especially key. You also need to identify your own incentives, and that gets very complicated. You know, big companies, small companies, they're all consuming these projects for different reasons, different products, all sorts of things. But you need to identify your own incentives, how those align with the important people in those projects, and then also identify those important players within these projects and start to identify their incentives. And you can, you can start to, uh, see sort of the ecosystem of incentives and where you might be at risk. All right, 
I want to leave you with really one thought. If you come away from this talk with one thing, it's this. Um, any solo maintainer dependency is a risky dependency. Uh, just look at the like high level logistics of it. One person, one person that is having that thing plopped into your product, plopped into your project, that's super scary, it's super risky. So, invest, 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 invest. Uh, you need to invest engineering resources. If you are blindly consuming these projects, blindly just, just pulling them down without being a part of the contributor community, without looking at the important players and what their incentives are, you're not helping. You need to be a part of those communities and bring engineering resources into the inner fold so that they can start getting on the maintainer track. With that, Cobra needs help. <laughs> So if you're interested, I would love to chat with people after, or you can find me there on uh, Twitter, uh, but I would love to take some questions as well. So thank you very, very much. I, th I think the, uh, there's a mic here in the center. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, please use the mic. Um, one question I have is, uh, I think you've made a pretty good point that this is a risk we should be aware of, but how do we best do that? So I, I, I just, for example, Go dependencies you mostly pull from GitHub and you cannot just see on the, on the, on the GitHub page that this is a, a, a risky dependency, something that's just bound by one maintainer. Um, I'm not, not sure for security things, there are websites that uh, collect security, CVEs, et cetera, that you can use for, to assess risk of dependencies? Is there some similar mechanism for maintainer risk, or do, do you have a suggestion how to, how to approach that? that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there are automatic things that can start to uh, pick up these things, like Dependabot on GitHub. Uh, you can use Dependabot, Dependabot to start picking up CVEs within packages that those things consume and on down the line. Uh, but a lot of what I ended up talking about was really people processes and, and people. And I, I don't think that there's automatic processes for picking up on those things. Uh, it really means that you have to be a part of those communities in some way, even if it's, you know, you know looking at the issues and seeing, you know, like, what's the tone of some of these people? Like, uh, you know, anecdotally, uh, a lot of people don't really seem very happy with me within Cobra, within the issues, and you can pick up in, on that in just looking at the issues, partly because I just don't have a lot of time to actually dedicate into the project. Somebody could look at that and say, hmm, it seems like there's something going on here. Maybe I need to get involved, you know, reach out to me on Twitter, you know, just ask, like, hey, is this project okay? Yeah, so it's, it's really, really hard. I don't know if there's a good solution from the, from the people side of it beyond getting involved in the community. Yeah, great question. I had the same question about how to actually identify dependencies. So thank you for answering that. And it's sure. really insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great talk. Uh, so do you believe that uh, open source projects should be owned by companies or sort of uh, organizations instead of individual maintainers? That's a, that's a great question. Um, really could have been, <laughs> probably also could have been its own talk. Uh, I don't know. You know, Cobra is really hard because it's been around for so long at that import path. So github.com slash SPF 13 slash Cobra has been around for almost 10 years now. So what happens when we try to move that into a GitHub org and it destroys everybody's import path? I know there's, you know, like different systems and things and we've talked about this and um, I don't think there's an easy solution for that. So. The history of a project I think is really important. Like for Cobra, you know, it's been around forever, so moving it into an org would be really challenging. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I wish I had a better answer for that. But uh, orgs are great, and I think that you know, uh, orgs with good governance, like we heard in the keynote this morning, can be really critical to ensuring the success of a project. I honestly should have added that as part of my uh, uh, contributor community part. But yeah, having something in an org with good governance and good contributor guidelines and like the, the getting on the maintainer track is well defined, that can be really, really powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So how do you deal with kind of uh, being the single maintainer? I mean, doesn't that stress you out? I know it would stress me out totally, like being responsible and I'm on vacation, but suddenly something comes up. Um, 
yeah, it's, it's not a good time. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, I do think about the weight of it, and I think about the responsibility of it, uh, which was, you know, part of that effort to bring a few more people in and actually get them also maintainer access. But in the end, today, it's really, it's really three of us. Uh, even that is scary, and even that, I would say, is a huge risk for such a big project. Um, you know, for me personally, it comes down to uh, like personal productivity things. You know, I time box Cobra pretty hard, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like dedicate much more time to it than I, I can. Like, I'm not getting paid to work on Cobra, uh, so I can only give it so much time so that my incentive models continue to align with it. Like, I do get a lot of personal satisfaction from it, but I'm only gonna work on it so much as my personal satisfaction and my incentive models continue to align. Um, it, it is stressful, yeah. I won't I won't deny that, and you know. Please uh, come chat with me about <laughs> getting on uh, our maintainer track and contributing back to Cobra. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, John. It was a wonderful talk. Thank um, you. The question I had was around the, the maintainer circle and how you bring people closer in that circle. Do you have sort of a, a litmus test on trust and when you would decide to give someone certain access rights? And what sort of tiers do you have? Is it just a singular tier or do you think about multiple ways to come closer? That's a great question, yeah. Um, I do think multiple tiers can make sense. Uh, like, still today, I don't actually have ownership access over Cobra. Um, SPF 13 is Steve Francis. He is the uh, product lead of Go at Google. So he, I think, by himself maintains uh, or has the ownership access over that repository. Again, I would say maybe that's a risk. But uh, I individually would not be able to go up that level to the admin level and blow the repository off of GitHub. Uh, that's only Steve, and you know he's he's kept this thing around for that long. Uh, I do think levels make sense uh, as far as the litmus test. Um, it really is people that I don't know. Even that's so hard. Again, that's a, that's a people question. Like, how do you judge somebody's character by their pull requests, their issues, your interactions on Slack? Uh, that can be really hard. There's been hacks in the past where people have gained you know somebody's trust, and then you know kind of worked their way into the inner circle. Before you know it, they're you know pushing bad code or something. Um, so I would even say within your inner circles, there need to be systems. Like, there shouldn't be people pushing directly to your main branch. I think that's just a good practice. Uh, but you should also have multiple people reviewing PRs. Uh, there's good, like, processes around the inner circles that I think can be powerful to mitigate that, uh, those things. But for me personally, it is sort of a gut check, sort of a gut feeling. You know, I, I've interacted uh, with a lot of people within Cobra. Uh, one person caught my eye pretty, pretty clearly. His name is Mark, and he did a lot of the uh, completion work within Cobra recently. So today, within the newest releases of Cobra, you can do uh, PowerShell, Z Shell, Fish, uh, Bash completions, and it's really, really good work. I don't think somebody would dedicate that much time and that much energy into this project if they weren't at least somewhat trustworthy. So that was a big litmus test for me with Mark, and he, he actually has come into that inner circle of, of maintainers. So it's really hard. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Hey, great talk. So I learned something yeah. about my code base today. It depends on Cobra. And yeah. uh, I don't know what package brings it in, but I don't use it directly. And auditing hundreds of packages that are brought in by other packages that are brought in by other packages, how yeah. do we fix that? How do you fix that? So you're asking, how do you fix the transitive dependencies? Yeah. That's because. Uh, yeah. That's nasty. I mean, the, the entire community needs to do their auditing, starting yeah. with you know, um, everything, or I don't know. Yeah, I, that's an excellent question. I don't really know if that's a solved, uh, I don't know if there's a really good solution to that. I'd love to talk to you afterwards, because even at VMware within Tanzu Community Edition, we've had problems with all these transitive dependencies coming over from like some other package that in, that's importing some other thing, and then you know, Dependabot is alerting, and we're like, oh my gosh, like what is this? We, we don't use this, right? Um, I don't know if, it's, if there's a good solution within Go itself, or if there's work that needs to be done up in the upstream within Go Mod, uh, but you know, I think the model that we saw with uh, Kubernetes coming to Cobra and saying, hey, uh, we see all these dependencies coming in from Viper, can we remove these? Uh, and I looked at it and I said, Yes, it'll be a huge effort, but we can. So finding where that's getting drawn in, you know, using Go Mod Graph or whatever it is, uh, finding where that dependency is getting uh, pulled in, maybe going into that project saying, why can I? Can we remove this? Do we need it? You know, finding out what is necessary, right? Thank you. Yeah. Um, follow up question, if I may. Uh, sure, I'll go um, as late as you like. <laughs> okay, um, I didn't even know I was using Cobra before today, so what about all the other hundred packages that I don't know about that are single maintainer? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, 
even more philosophically, I would say this is a very big problem, not, not just Cobra, not just Kubernetes, but you know, like there are hundreds of thousands of these throughout, you know, throughout the internet and the, uh, the, the just the software industry as a whole. Um, I don't know. I wish I had a better answer uh, beyond like, hey, get involved. Like, hey, we need to be better about this. Um, it's really, it's really about trust. Like, I think about, I think about that event stream package story all the time because it was, it was one person. It was one person that just said like, yeah, I don't use this anymore. I'll give it away. Uh, I wish there was a better system beyond like being vigilant, uh, creating those automatic systems to maybe detect uh, when you know there's inconsistencies in your deliverables or something weird is happening. Um, that's the best we can do from an automatic software standpoint. And then yeah, getting involved in important projects that live in your upstream. Yeah. Super. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I was going to actually ask what the gentleman earlier asked around how you would vet a new maintainer when they joined the project. Um, but I was also going to ask, clearly coming here today is a sort of call for help um, in part. Have you tried other techniques to try and get more maintainers and have they been successful or what have you or haven't you tried? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I've, I've tried a number of different things. Um, it's... Hmm. <laughs> You know, it sort of is the Game of Thrones of open source sometimes, where you know you don't want to step on this person's toes by doing this and that. Like, I think it would be a mistake to just go and fork Cobra. Uh, again, it's it's all the import paths. It's like how many things it touches across uh, the CNCF and Kubernetes ecosystem. I mean, that would just be like a Herculean effort to just be like, we're going to fork this into our own organization uh, without, you know, first chatting with Steve Francis, chatting with me, chatting with people in Kubernetes and throughout the CNCF. Um, yeah, again, I wish I had a better answer, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. No problem. Hi, thank you for your talk. And sure. so I would like to share a, maybe an idealist opinion, but rather than having a single maintainer, which is a single point of failure, do you think that it is, for, it is possible to say to people, for example, that, okay, you contributed this to my project, and so for future modification of this part that you contributed, you will be the maintainer of this part only, and so it will relieve you some pain because you will still have to click the merge button for sure, but you will have someone that already contributed and that We'll just do the code review for you, for example. I know that some projects do this, for example, in BitRoot, when you add a recipe, you are sort of maintainer of the recipe, so you are right, not forcefully right. to, you have not to maintain it, but it is appreciated from the main maintainer if you do it. So right. what's your opinion? That's, I think that's a really interesting idea, and I do think it's something that's been tried. Um, unfortunately, like I go back to that chunk on the lottery factor. I mean, people, I mean, I think you'd be pretty hard pressed to get anybody to stick around. Say they, you know, contributed 200 lines of code. That person's gone, more often than not. You know, and like that's a useful. Maybe that's a very useful chunk of code that's being committed in. I don't know if you would want to uh, hold off on a merge just because this person's like, you know, maybe I don't have the time. Maybe I don't have the bandwidth. But this would be really useful to me. I think being accessible is is really important within a contributor community. So I don't think I would personally do that. It. Um, it would keep, I think, a lot of people out. And in the end, you would almost end up with just like an extreme silo of just a few people willing to stick around to do that, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, it really is sort of a, like, you know, you're, you're really fishing for those people, you know, the really dedicated people, like I brought up Mark. Uh, Mark is great. And, um, you know, I noticed pretty, pretty early on that, you know, he was showing up and he was uh, contributing to the discussion, not only in Slack, but issues and PRs and doing reviews. And it was clear to me that this person was sticking around. Um, I think it'd be a lot harder to s just tell somebody like, no, I'm not merging this until you, you know, dedicate yourself or dedicate some time or something. And again, incentive models. Like, why, why would anybody? Like, it, it gets really hard to say like, no, you, I'm not going to merge this until you stick around. People are still going to leave even, even if they agree. <laughs> They're going to tell you, yeah, sure, I'll stick around. They'll stick around for a month or two and then, you know, uh, uh, like wash away essentially, right? It's, it's super hard. I think that's an interesting idea and I do think it's been tried before, but I don't know if that's the approach I would take. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, we're a bit over time. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'll hang out here. Um, thank you.